But we do live in significant times, don't we, folks? As Jenny mentioned in her prayer, it is the political season, isn't it? And interestingly in Virginia, when we moved here 25 years ago, we didn't know that the town we live in, Buena Vista, Virginia, is the beginning of the political season on Labor Day. Did you know that? The 53rd annual Labor Day parade happened this year, and all the politicians who are running for office, it seems, all the main office come to little old University of Virginia, Glen Morey Park. And they make speeches, the politicians all show up, they have breakfasts, and uh, try to make their pitch to the people why they should be elected. Now, you know, some people have strong feelings about politics. Did you know that? <laughs> But if people get so worked up about politics that they're angry and argumentative, it makes me wonder, is their faith more in politics than it is in God sometimes? I wonder. There was a candidate for city council once who was doing some door-to-door -door campaigning and things were going pretty well, he thought, until he came to the house of a grouchy old man. After he gave his little speech, the old man growled, vote for you? Well, I'd rather vote for the devil. At that point, the candidate realized he didn't stand a chance of swaying the old man. But with a smile, he said, I understand, but in case your friend the devil isn't running, may I count on your vote? <laughs> now, I'll admit that today's message might be a little controversial, but as your pastor, I want to examine with you what the Bible says about whether God's people should vote. Because every election cycle, I'm amazed that there are some people that struggle with this. Should I vote? Shouldn't I vote? Why this sermon? Well, it is an election year, and as brethren, we should be concerned about the Bible, the whole Bible, and nothing but the Bible. When God has spoken, my opinion doesn't matter, and your opinion doesn't matter, does it? We need to know what God says. Now, some Christians believe that politics is evil, and it can be. But what does the Bible say? That should be our question, especially as brethren. Now, some citizens don't think that their vote matters. And you can believe that if you want to, but there's a lot of history that disproves that. Back in 1984, the California Secretary of State compiled an interesting list. Look at this list. In 1776, the United States decided to speak English instead of German by one vote. In 1845, Texas became part of the United States by one vote. In 1868, President Andrew Johnson avoided impeachment by one vote. In 1876, France went from a monarchy to a republic by one vote. 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes was elected U.S. President by one vote. Get this one, 1933, Adolf Hitler was elected Nazi Party leader by one vote. In 1960, one vote changed and each Illinois precinct would have denied JFK the presidency. Isn't that interesting? So you say, well, why vote? Because yours might be the deciding vote. And I believe that as God's people, we should honor the sacred privilege and vote at every election. But let me ask you a question. Do you think God cares how you vote and who you vote for? Think about that. The Bible seems to indicate that he does. You might say, where? Well, I'm glad you asked. We're going to turn in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 29, verse 2. Proverbs is a book of divine wisdom applied to earthly conditions. Someone said a proverb is a short statement based on long experience. We quote modern proverbs all the time. Let me give you some examples. An apple a day. Okay. Here's another one. Haste makes... Wait, see, those are modern proverbs. But before we turn to the Word of God, let's talk again briefly to the God of the Word. Father, we come to you today to hear from you. Please speak to us through your Word. Teach us something new. Convict us. Remind us of what we know and what we need to do. Show us Jesus. We ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior and your Son. Amen. Now, a biblical proverb is a short statement based on long experience infused with divinely inspired truth. The, the word proverbs actually comes from the Hebrew word that means wisdom. There's a lot of wisdom in that book. The New Living Testament Bible reminds us 
that all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and it teaches us to do what is right. So it says that some scripture is helpful that way, right? No. It says all scripture, right? All scripture. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with the proverb we're looking at today, but I do know this. It is a word from God for our nation as we approach the election in November. Proverbs 29.2, I'm calling it a word to the wise. In this proverb, we will find the answer to the question, why should Christians vote? So let's look at it together in several versions. Okay, first King James. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. The NIV puts it this way. When the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. New American Standard says when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, they groan. And lastly, let's look at the message. It says when good people run things, everyone is glad. But when the ruler is bad, everyone groans. There's a lot of truth in that, isn't there? So to answer the question, why should Christians vote, we're going to examine this proverb and look at another passage in the Psalms. And there's three parts to this answer, why should Christians vote? And folks, this is important. We hear from the media all the time how people vote by their pocketbook, right? You know, how is this going to benefit me? But I want to tell you something. If you don't get anything else, I want you to get this. If you vote by your pocketbook you will live to regret it. But if you vote by God's book, you will be blessed. If you vote by your pocketbook, you'll live to regret it. But if you vote by God's book, you'll be blessed. So the first part of the answer is why should Christian vote is a wise observation. The Bible says when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. So that begs the question then, Who are the righteous, right? We need to know that. Who are the righteous? Okay, so the dictionary says that righteous people are those who are always behaving according to a moral or a religious code. So for the Christian, righteousness is obedience to God's word in everything, not just when it pleases us or when it's convenient. To be righteous means we obey God all the time. Okay, so who are the righteous? Are they the people who go to church then? No. The righteous people are those who honor God's laws and his word without compromise. They conform to an ethical standard that is right and true, and they avoid the wrong and they do the right. They don't just talk about it. They do it. Now, secular society gives us a different message, doesn't it? Secular society says, you don't need religion. You don't need God. You don't need morality, right? They say there is no standard of ethics, virtues, or values. There's no fixed meaning, in fact, to anything in life. Everything is part of this ongoing process of interpretation, right? Truth is whatever you want it to be. If it feels good, what's the saying? Do it, right? Everybody does what's right in their own eyes. You're the standard. You decide. In fact, a lot of people say you're God. You're the God in your life. In his book, How Should We Then Live?, Francis Schaeffer wrote something interesting. He said, when there are no absolutes whereby to govern society, society itself becomes the absolute. This is a new problem. God's people Israel fell into the same trap in the Old Testament. Judges 17, 6 said, in those days, Israel had no king, and all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Boy, that's contemporary, isn't it? That's the world we live in. Such self-centered behavior results in anarchy. That destroys the very fabric of a society until that society no longer exists. Case in point, the Roman Empire. And interestingly, the very things that destroyed the Roman Empire are already at work in our culture to destroy the very foundation upon which this great nation was founded. In America today, we have kicked God out And lust and greed have taken over. Even Christians don't obey God's word. Everyone does what they think is right. Isn't that true? In fact, more than 20 years ago, 
I heard about an interview with a very popular former president and his wife who explained that they grew up in a church where everybody decided for themselves what was right. And when I heard that, that explained an awful lot of that presidency. Folks, God will bless when righteous people lead a nation. That's, that's a very famous painting of the very first constitutional convention where they called on a pastor to lead in prayer. And folks, after they prayed, they were able to resolve some of their differences. Even Ben Franklin talked about it. God will bless when righteous people lead a government. God established human government when Noah and his family, if you will remember, left the ark after the flood. The Schofield Study Bible says this, In this new dispensation, although man's direct moral responsibility to God continued, you know, Jesus said, give to God what is God's, God delegated to man certain areas of his authority in which he was to obey God through submission to his fellow man. And that's where Jesus said, gives to Caesar what is Caesar's. So God instituted a corporate relationship of man to man in human government. So the words to live by for us today are vote righteousness. Vote righteousness. What is God telling us? The principle to apply is this. If you have a voice in your government, thank God for that. And if you do have that voice, put as many righteous people in authority as you possibly can. God set up government to restrain evil and to bring order to human life. And therefore, you can argue that it is God's plan that government be led by righteous people. Such a government will be blessed by God. Proverbs 14, verse 34 says this, Righteousness exalts a nation. But sin is a disgrace to any people. So when do the righteous come into authority? Well, when the righteous increase in number, influence, and power. Proverbs 29 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules... The people groan. So when the righteous, by increasing their numbers and influence, assert themselves in government, the people are better off. And you want proof of that? Last Easter, there was a very famous atheist. I think he lives in England. His name is Richard Dawkins. Have you ever heard of Richard Dawkins? Very famous atheist. He agreed with what I just said, and he said that he was himself a cultural Christian. That when he looked at the influence of other religions on societies, he felt that the Christian culture was a better place to live. Isn't that interesting? An atheist. So how do the righteous come into authority? Well, there's two ways. First of all, by the sovereignty of God. Romans 13 says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. So God is sovereign, right? God is sovereign. But the righteous also come into authority through the free will of man. We have a government in America, very unique in the world, of the people, by the people, and for the people. We call that democracy. And in America, we can put righteous people in authority by our own will, can't we? In a lot of countries, you can't do that, right? We're not citizens of a nation where the people have no voice, right? Like North Korea and other dictatorships. For more than 200 years, we have been one nation under God. God has blessed us to be a part of this great nation. I was born here. You were born. Wasn't that a great blessing to be born in America? We didn't get to. I, t I tell the kids at school, I say, you know what the secret to success is? Choose your parents well. <laughs> I didn't choose. To, God put me here. God put you here. What a blessing we have, right? We have a voice. We have a vote. What a privilege. What a responsibility. Folks, listen. It is the duty of Christians to vote to keep the righteous in authority. We can elect leaders with biblical values. The Bible says we're to be the salt of the earth, to season society rather than let society affect us. Folks, remember, leaders in America cannot get into office or lead except by the people's consent. It is the consent of the governed. So what is the effect of righteous leadership? What is the effect? Well, the people rejoice, the Bible says. That's the effect of righteous leadership. God's blessing is upon people who elect righteous leaders to govern them. Citizens are more secure where good people set the tone for society. Public virtue produces public well-being. So the first part of the answer, why should Christians vote, is a wise observation. 
when the people rejoice. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. If you have a choice, you want to put the righteous in positions of authority. Now, the second part of our answer is a solemn warning. A very solemn warning. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn or they groan. So here's a question to think about. Who are the wicked? Who are the wicked? It is those who sin against God and their neighbors, those who defy God's laws and scorn His authority, those who listen to the counsel of the ungodly, those who take bribes, those who justify the guilty, condemn the just, and oppress people with heavy taxation. And here's the danger. In Ezekiel 14, God tells Ezekiel that there comes a time when a nation's sin so completely condemn it that not even the remnant of righteous people can stop the destruction that is inherent in evil. In fact, God said that even if righteous Noah, Job, or Daniel lived in that nation, they could only save themselves by their righteousness. There comes a time where you have to say, is it bad enough? When do the wicked come into authority? When does that happen? They're in authority when the wicked, the ungodly, and the unrighteous increase in number and in influence and in power. How do the wicked come into authority? It's really simple, folks. Edmund Burke said it. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do what? Nothing. Nothing. Much of history is explained by his observation. Time and again, good people seem to clearly outnumber those who are evil, and yet those who are evil seem to prevail far too often. Rarely is it the majority that determine the outcome, but whether those who claim to be good are willing to stand up and fight for what they know to be right. And what is the effect of wicked leadership? Well, according to the Bible, the people mourn, they groan, They groan because of violence and injustice. The moral character of their government largely determines the well-being of people. Immoral government ruins nations. We've seen that time and again down through history. Remember Chuck Colson? He was an advisor to President Nixon. Look at what he said. About the 20th century, he said, millions more have died this century at the hands of their own government dictatorships than in war with other nations. Folks, listen, blessing accompanies righteous government and curses accompanies wicked government. The choice is clear, okay? There are two contrasting directions that countries can go. They can choose righteousness or wickedness. They can choose blessings or curses. And they can choose rejoicing or mourning. And thankfully, we have a voice, but that's the choice before us every election cycle. Here's some words to live by. To avoid good leaders, do nothing with your vote. So the first part of the answer to why Christian votes is a wise observation. The second part of the answer is a solemn warning. If you can avoid it, keep the wicked people in your country from ruling. And that brings us to the third part of the answer, and it involves a call to action. A call to action. And this comes to us from Psalm 11, verse 3. The Bible says, when the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, what does that mean? Well, Barnes notes in the Old Testament says this, the foundations are the great principles of truth and righteousness that uphold the society. When they're destroyed, truth is no longer respected. Justice is no longer practiced. Fraud and violence take place of honesty and honor. Error prevails in character, integrity, and virtue no longer provides security. So what should the righteous do? We need to look to God for direction, first of all. And I want to show you what Psalm 11 says. It reminds us the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous. But the wicked and those who love violence his soul hates. On the wicked he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. Upright men will see his face. 
Again, let me read to you what Barnes says about this. The righteous have nothing to fear, he says. They have a protector in heaven and can appeal to him for protection and be safe. The Lord's throne is in heaven. As king, he rules the universe with justice. The righteous, therefore, may hope in his protection and need not flee when the wicked attack them. The believer can have unwavering confidence in God, who sits on the throne of the universe and administers its affairs with justice and truth. Beloved, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his throne. Look to him. Look to him. The next thing I believe the righteous should do is we need to pray for revival. We've been talking about that, right? Have you been doing it? I hope you've been doing it. Pray for revival. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 7.14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Folks, we need to pray for a revival where we teach our children biblical values, where the church awakens to be the salt and light in our culture that it should be, where unbelievers are converted to faith in Christ, and where the majority in the nation turn to God, and godly leaders with biblical values are elected to office. That's what we need to pray for. We need that kind of revival. And you know something practical? If you're not registered to vote, well, there's still time, do it. Okay? I'm told this Tuesday is uh, the last time you can register to vote online, okay? I read somewhere that you can register to vote in person until Election Day, but I'd call to be sure about that because I'm not sure. Folks, we need to vote for our biblical values. Dr. Tony Evans, a well-known preacher and Bible teacher, says Christians must vote according to kingdom values instead of the world's values. He encouraged believers to vote for the party, platform, and person that best reflects the kingdom of God. And Evans points out that neither Republicans nor Democrats have a monopoly on kingdom values. We need to remember that. A number of years ago, a David Barton survey for Christian values over three elections noted this. 45% of evangelical Christians who voted said that money was more important to them than morals when they voted. They cared less about moral issues as long as the economy stayed healthy. As a very famous advisor said, it's the economy, stupid. Remember what I said earlier? If you vote by your pocketbook, you will live to regret it. But if you vote by God's book, you'll be blessed. You remember President Woodrow Wilson? He was from Virginia. You know that, right? There's a famous library from him up in Stanton. Look at what his last words to the American people were. The sum of the whole matter is this. Our civilization cannot survive materially unless it be redeemed spiritually. Wise words. William Bennett, I believe he was the former Secretary of Education, said this. Material gains will not be enough here. If we achieve full employment and greater economic growth, and if we have a city of gold and alabaster, but our children have not learned how to walk in goodness, justice, and mercy, then the American experiment, no matter how gilded, will have failed. And let's remind ourselves, it was an experiment, right? No other nation had the former government we got. Folks, listen, we must not allow morals to take a back seat in our elections. Take your Christian convictions with you to the polls in November and vote for biblical values. Take a stand. For righteousness to prevail, Christians must vote their convictions. And I'm not referring to Republican or Democratic Party values. The struggle for biblical values, folks, is real in America today. Folks, listen, the scriptures are not ambiguous. It is clear what Jesus was saying when he talked about hiding your light under a bowl. He said, neither do people put a light, light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. What is our light? Folks, our light is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news about Jesus and what he did for us. That Jesus died for sinners. People need to admit that. That Jesus paid for your sin. You need to believe that. And that he rose from the dead as Lord of all. And you need to confess that. That's our light. Not some kind of political value. 
People need Jesus. If they come to Jesus, God has a way of fixing what's wrong inside of people, doesn't he? Bringing them peace and hope. We must take a stand for the life-changing gospel. Politics and politicians can never save people from their sin or bring hope to wounded hearts. Only Jesus saves and heals people's hearts and families. Brothers and sisters, we are disobeying the word of God when we allow ungodly forces to shut us up and shut us down. We have the truth on our side. We cannot let a radical vocal minority of self-proclaimed church state experts tell us that we don't have the same right as any other American. Faith-filled or faithless to step into the public square and let our voice be heard respectfully and with love. Shame on us if we remain cowering in dark corners of the culture because of a handful of so-called constitutional experts who have told us that we can't take our light where we know it needs to be seen. And furthermore, that we don't understand our rights under the Constitution. Like the Apostle Paul who claimed his rights as a Roman citizen, there is a time to stand up and to speak out and send the message that God has the answer. He has the answer to the pain, the heartache and trouble that afflicts so many in our nation. And he alone can bring people peace. There are Christians who rather than voting faith values, vote political values. And it's the church's obligation to train and support and help people understand the biblical values, how to apply biblical principles when they live as citizens and vote as citizens. Now, I'm not trying to tell people how to vote, but instead, instead help you understand and how to frame the election in terms of biblical principles and politics. And that's why I say unapologetically, vote for biblical values and not political values. It is better to be biblically correct than politically correct, folks. Let me be specific. Christians should vote for the candidates who best embrace the Judeo-Christian ethic that we hold dear. When you go to the voting booth in November, remember biblical values. What are biblical values? Respect for human life. Family values, the rule of law and God's plan for marriage. Why? Because God honors and respects those things. So, okay, what should we do? We must allow our faith to inform our decisions about candidates and issues that we support. As Christ followers, we need to bring his kingdom and his spirit and his values into all areas of our life, including the election season. Folks, Christians cannot sit on the sidelines. We need to engage, whether it is spiritual or cultural battles, and our nation will pay a heavy price if people of faith fail to exercise their God-given civic duty. It is a blessing that we have and take for granted. In this election year, the people of God need to come off the sidelines and get into the game. The stakes are too high. We must determine to fight this good fight of faith and to be passionate in our commitment to prevail for the sake of America's future. So, how do we get out of survival mode and into revival mode? The Bible tells us. Acts 3, it says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Folks, the simplest definition of revival I've ever heard is this. We need to bring our obedience level up to our knowledge level. Isn't that simple? We need to bring our obedience level up to our knowledge level. Now, I don't want to stand before God and hear him say, why didn't you warn my people? Why didn't you teach them? Why didn't you exhort and admonish them? And I've done my best this morning to show you from God's word why your vote matters as a Christian and why you need to cast your vote for biblical values in November. And now the choice is, yours. What does the Bible say? When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. I want to remind you that if you're here today without Jesus Christ, that you need to trust him to save you from your sin. It is the only way to peace. He is the only hope for our wounded hearts. And if you're here listening or if you're online and listening, if you'll just talk to God right now in your heart and say something like this, Father, I turn away from myself and my sin. I come to you in Jesus' name. Please accept me and adopt me, not for what I've done, but because of what Jesus Christ did for me, dying on the cross. The Bible says you can be a child of God this very day. Amen? Amen.
Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, please help us remember the truths of your word in the coming month. May we be as bold in sharing our faith as we are in sharing our opinions. Please give us courage to stand on our convictions, and to be ambassadors of your peace, the peace that passes all understanding. Help us to apply our faith in a way that points others to Jesus Christ. For I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.